I'm Daryl Owens. Welcome to a world of difference. It's not unusual for parents to gaze at their kids and see little mirrors reflecting back. Children can inherit mom and dad's eyes, hair color, freckles, and other physical traits. And if mom and dad's brains are wired differently, time may reveal that their little ones also learn differently. Rearing children is tough enough, but when it's all in the neurodiverse family, navigating the daily challenges of schoolwork and household tasks can prove extra challenging. Yet, while parents and children who learn differently may experience more trials in understanding each other in the world, these mom and dads may also be uniquely equipped to support youngsters with learning disabilities for having lived their shared experience. On this episode, you'll meet a mom with learning differences who is walking the neurodiverse journey hand in hand with her neurodiverse son. Next, our panel of experts will share wise counsel and helpful tips for multi-generational neurodiverse families. Later, you'll meet our latest difference maker who turned the page on a writing-focused learning disability by cranking out scores of best-selling and award-winning children's books. First, we meet a mother and son whose neurodiverse journeys began nearly simultaneously and learn how they are finding strength, hope, and success unlocking solutions to their often common challenges. Correspondent Danny Pytel brings us their story. Today we find ourselves in Columbus, Ohio, where we're meeting the Atkinson family. My name is Ashley Atkinson. I am the 2021 Mrs. West Virginia United States of America. I have a 14-year-old son who also has autism, dyslexia, and ADHD. Ashley and her husband, Alan, are parents to two children, Jesse and Olivia. Outside of parenting, Ashley is an advocate for autism and dyslexia using her unique platform to spread awareness. I mean, people notice the sparkly sash and the crown, but with it, that gets their attention, but I can actually talk about important things to me. So I get to talk about autism. I get to talk about dyslexia. I get to explain the fact that dyslexia is not just reversing your Bs and Ds, and that only 40% of people with dyslexia have that. And a lot of people think that if you don't reverse them, then you don't have dyslexia. And it's, it's so much more than that, just like autism. It's so much more than just their, they have sensory overload. Um, it's so much more than just behavior issues and there's a lot more to it and I think the more awareness we get out there, the more acceptance that we get out there, the better the world's gonna be. Once her son Jesse received his diagnosis, Ashley was shocked at what she also discovered. I was 30 something years old when I learned I had dyslexia and I did not realize it until after my son was diagnosed with dyslexia. I questioned the doctor on how he has dyslexia and then she went through the list and I related to every single part of that because I'm like, uh-huh, yep, I got that. That's exactly what I do, which is the moment I started realizing I also have dyslexia. As the pieces began falling into place, Ashley realized why she struggled so hard in college. My dyslexia helps me really understand the consequences of not receiving intervention or help. My brain works differently and I learn differently and that's why it was so hard for me to go to an online college and learn through just reading and then having to read my homework assignment and then watch a YouTube video about the subject to try to understand what it was like and then go back to the reading assignment to then try to figure out what it is that they're saying because I couldn't just read something and comprehend it. Ashley's dyslexia proved most difficult when she found herself homeschooling Jesse and having to help him with his assignments. Homework is definitely the most overwhelming part of having dyslexia and parenting, especially when COVID hit and we were doing so much schoolwork at home, at which point I realized I can't teach him any form of English. I can't teach him the sentences. I can't teach him his reading. I can't work on that with him. So we had to figure out other ways to compensate for me not being able to homeschool him on that aspect. I would say homework would be hard at most times. Like most people learn the same way when I learn differently, that we can think of the same thing, but go completely two different directions. 
it just depends what the homework is. And then my child's looking to me for advice and as a parent, I should have these answers and I just don't always know. It's challenging to help your kid read a word that you don't know how to read yourself. Both Ashley and Alan work closely with Jesse to make sure he is always giving it his best, no matter what his learning differences are. He's very much aware of what his diagnoses are, but we will not allow him to use that as an excuse. So if he's struggling with something, he's like, but it's because I have. I'm like, no, 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 no. That does not work. We cannot use a diagnosis as a reason to not try. We use it as a reason to say, hey, I might need to approach this differently, not as an excuse not to do something. And I think that is a really big, vital part that a lot of parents are missing, especially if they don't have a diagnosis. Um, me having the diagnosis, I'm like, hey, yeah, I had dyslexia and had no help and still graduated from an online program with my bachelor's degree. I think you can complete one eighth grade assignment. Despite having the support of her family growing up, Ashley always struggled to learn. I mean, my parents loved me and supported me of whatever I wanted to do, and I had siblings, but nobody had the experiences that I had. So it was a matter of self-determination and figuring it out the hard way and not giving up. So for me to have a support system, I had people that loved me, but they had no idea how to help me or support me. So I don't really ever feel like I had a support system. I had to rely on just pure determination to be able to get things done that I wanted to accomplish. So I really want to make sure that my children get the support that they need to make sure they don't struggle the way that I struggled. With no support system in place, Ashley began to think outside of the box to build a new supportive community. I created my YouTube channel, one, to create a support system for us because we didn't know anybody else who had autism. We didn't know anybody else who had dyslexia. We didn't know anybody that had multiple diagnoses and learning differences the way our son had. So it was great to be able to actually meet other people who not only had autism and dyslexia together, that that did exist and they were being successful in life, but it was really great to help us be able to relate to other people as well. And it's been really fun seeing that other people around the entire world have similar challenges and the way that they're addressing it differently and how that might help our family or vice versa. Getting a diagnosis can take time due to long wait lists and once diagnosed, learning can still be an uphill battle. However, Ashley finds herself optimistic for her children's future. I have full confidence that my kids are going to be okay because I know that with enough determination and enough willpower that if I can accomplish my dreams despite not even knowing why I learn differently or how to adjust to those differences, I have full confidence that with intervention and some extra help that my kids can go above and beyond whatever it is that they dream of. For World of Difference, I'm Danny Pytel. Danny, thanks for that inspiring report. Next, our experts explore the secrets of thriving when both caregivers and kiddos learn differently. Dr. Chelsea Haig Zavaleta is the founder of Guiding Cooperation and Positive Parenthood, which offers courses and coaching to families raising neurodiverse children. Alexander Morris Wood is the Dean of Admissions, Transition Programs, and Strategic Outreach at Beacon College in Leesburg, Florida, which is America's first accredited college or university dedicated to educating students with learning disabilities, ADHD, and other learning differences. Day Sanchez is a school psychologist education specialist, and the founder of 2E Minds, a company that supports the optimal psychological, creative, spiritual, and socio-emotional development of neurodiverse and twice exceptional children. All right, well, let's start the discussion with Dr. Haig Zavaleta. Chelsea, one in five children lives with learning or retention issues such as dyslexia or ADHD, and when they grow up, many presumably have families. Can we assume that multi-generational neurodiverse households are fairly common? Yeah, I think we can. There are a number of families dealing with multiple issues, both in parents and in children. And 
sometimes these these issues travel across generations. I think right now, especially, we're seeing a lot of families who were missed during the pandemic. And so it feels like there are more families needing more support right now. And for all of those families, it's to say, okay, we have some we have some challenges and there's lots of ways we, we can work through them so that both parents and children can be successful. Thank you, doctor. Alex, can you talk about the added layer of complexity that parenting with learning disabilities adds to the parenting game? Sure. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest layer of complexity is for the parent to separate their experience from their child. Um, I think we have to remember that anybody with a learning attention issue um, classified as neurodiverse has had their own experience in the system. So then when the parent is guiding their child through the system, you know, separating their experiences from education, maybe from the transition to college, social emotional issues to their students can be a little difficult. Um, but I also think outside of the complexity, there is a great opportunity there. Um, families are able to connect and empathize and sympathize in a way that others might not be able to. So for every difficulty, I think there's a huge benefit when you see a family with multiple people who are neurodiverse. Thank you, Alex. Day, studies show that rearing a child who learns differently amps up the family stress. So in general, is stress on overload when both parents and kids have learning and attention issues? Yes, and the answer is yes, but th this doesn't mean that every neurodiverse family has to uh, go through this. There are there are steps that families can take to reverse this stress. And for example, one thing that we know about families of neurodivergent children is that they experience or they are at, uh, at an increased risk to experience compassion fatigue, which can, which can lead to um, burnout and irritability. And this can affect the relationship with the child. And this can also affect the interactions between the family members but there are steps that uh, families can take to reverse and or to prevent compassion fatigue and other types of stressors like these. All right, thank you, Day. Chelsea, um, parents typically stress education, but for parents with learning differences who struggle with the three R's, might their anxiety or depression about their learning issues dampen their child's enthusiasm for pushing through his or her own issues? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's great. So I think one of the things we know about children and families is that the way that they learn about their world, their challenges, how to access um, their resources is through co-regulated exchanges, primarily with parents and then with other adults. And so certainly if parents and families have kind of heightened um, experiences of chronic stress, which we know that families experiencing um, the challenges that travel together with neurodiversity certainly do, uh, there may be less opportunities for that kind of solid co-regulation. And I think that what we want to focus on here is that, yes, there may be more challenges. And also, there are ways that these kinds of families can learn to slow down engage over and over and over again in those kinds of co-regulated exchanges so that the the kind of defining tenor of the family um, tends towards empathy, towards understanding, towards co-regulated exchanges so that kids can thrive. Certainly a parent's own experiences shape what that will look like, right? Shape the neural pathways that families kind of run on. And also there's lots of opportunities to step outside of those and learn something new. Can you give us an example of what you're referring to uh, of these co-regulated exchanges? Yeah. So. Um, if you've had a parent who's perhaps um, struggled academically themselves as a child, right, when they go to help their own child who may also be struggling academically and perhaps even with the same thing, um, there might be some trigger, some upset, some challenge that comes up for the parent that makes it hard for them to slow down and focus on their child and focus on a, um, a co-regulated co exchange in which they're present for their child's experience. And so having opportunities to kind of process that and work through it so that they can show up for their kiddo um, can be really powerful. All right. Well, thank you. 
Alex, is it common for the worry about being judged on their ability to parent? Uh, does that shame neurodiverse moms and dads from seeking professional support or help from family and friends a lot? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question because I think first it's important to remember that most people who are neurodiverse that went through the American education system, especially in special education, that they went through a model that is based on people's deficits. So services um, were geared towards building skills based on areas of weakness. They've had their own experience with um, educators, counselors, social groups, psychiatrists, and I think when the parent, when the, the student becomes the parent and that role changes, I could absolutely see some hesitation in wanting to seek out services because not only are they going to now watch their child go through a similar model, um, because of the role of the parent in the education system, they're also gonna be looked at critically about what they're doing to enhance skill development or um, deter from skill development. So it might not be so much um, always shame related, but it could be fear based. It could be based um, off of their own projection of their prior experiences like we've been talking about. Um, and maybe some fear that um, they're not going to be able to intervene in a way that teachers, counselors, school professionals will, will deem appropriate. So I definitely think there is a form of hesitation there that will deter from like a fully collaborative model. Thank you, Alex. Day, so you, you have these families where, where parents and kids are struggling with issues such as distractibility, impulsivity, disorganization, communication, and, and inappropriate social skills. What can parents do to ensure that these issues don't derail their children's success in school and beyond? That's a really good question. So every neurodiverse family looks different and there are many factors that contribute to more positive or negative outcomes. So we are looking at uh, child characteristics and the parent characteristics and the interplay between these uh, factors. We are also looking at, at cultural factors, societal factors, the amount of supports that the family has. We are also looking at uh, challenges and weaknesses and all the interplays of these things. And so one of the things that I always tell my the parents that I work with is to remember their ABCs. So A stands for awareness, B stands for balance, and C stands for connection. And so in terms of awareness, we want to make sure that parents are aware of the kind of supports that they might have available to them or that they might have access to in the school setting or community-based supports. We also want to make sure that families are aware of their own uh, triggers, emotional triggers, or sensory needs, sensory preferences, and know when the child's preferences and needs might clash with the parents. And also we want to make sure that parents are aware of the kind of supports or skills that they might be deficient on and that they need to build. Watch the full Ask the Experts segment on our website at awodtv.org if you want to learn more about navigating life as a multi-generational neurodiverse family. You can also watch or listen on Facebook, YouTube, or on your favorite podcasting platform. Next, let's reveal our latest difference maker. As part of a family that produced writers since the 19th century, you might say Avi was born to write. Unless you knew him in grade school, where Avi struggled with spelling, sloppiness, and reversing letters on his schoolwork as a result of dysgraphia, a learning disability characterized by problems with writing. Yet his love of books and the written word led him to the library where he served book lovers as a librarian and later went on to an award-winning career writing more than 70 books, including two Newbery Award winners that children now rush to the library to check out. Senior correspondent Cindy Peterson brings us his story. Award-winning children's book author Avi Wartis, pen named as Avi, has had a successful career as a writer with more than 80 published works, despite it being his worst subject in school. Uh, I was not a very good student. I just, 
I just accepted that. But teachers would call on me. I couldn't supply an answer. And they would say, well, let's go to your smart sister. And she would do fine. But that psychologically was not a very good thing for me. On Fridays, um, there were spelling tests. And I always did very badly at them. And every Friday, I would announce that I was too sick to go to school. But my father, who was a doctor, would look down my throat and say, you're fine. And off I would go to fail another spelling test. Although Avi was an avid reader, he continued to struggle with writing throughout high school until one teacher changed his focus. At the end of my second year, the English teacher called my parents and said that I was the worst student he had ever had. And that unless I had tutoring and learned to type, my handwriting was very bad. They were not gonna let me back in the school. And that summer I spent with a English, no, excuse me, a teacher friend of my parents. And she looked at my writing and she said something that nobody had ever said to me before. She said, you're an interesting person. If you wrote better, people would know that. That changed my life. Avi decided to pursue a career in writing and found it odd when his parents discouraged him from this path. But somewhere in that year, in 1955, I wrote down, it was March of that year. It said, I've decided I'm going to be a writer. And that's me announcing to myself that I'm gonna be a writer. And from that point on, uh, writing was the focus of my interest. But my folks actively discouraged me from becoming a writer. They, were telling, they wouldn't tell me why. But uh, they said, no, oh, you can do this, you can do that, but don't become a writer. What Avi didn't know at the time is that he had dysgraphia, a neurological disorder affecting written expression and difficulty converting the sounds into written form. However, despite his parents' discouragement, he went on to college to become a playwright. Uh, if there's one characteristic of me as a person, um, stubbornness. So I go off to college and um, I wind up at the University of Wisconsin and I'm majoring in theater and history. Mm. And I'm writing or trying to write plays. There's a playwriting contest for students and um, I enter it and I do, do not win it, but I get notes from the judges unbeknownst to the judge because my name wasn't on my submission mm. was somebody who taught a playwriting class and he wrote uh, this is not a very good play but clearly the writer is somebody who is not a native English speaker and is trying to learn the English language and he should be encouraged to continue his studies okay thanks tells you something about my writing. Wow. But the next year I win that contest. Wow. And the play is produced and more to the point, it's published in the school literary magazine. And that's my first publication. When Avi became a father, he would make up stories to tell his kids, which led to him becoming a children's author. He was traveling the country reading his books at schools when one teacher made an astonishing assessment that would finally give Avi the answers he'd been searching for. But one time as I did that, a reading teacher who saw these slides, that's what I was showing, came up to me and said, did you know that you're dysgraphic? And I had never even heard the term before. And I, I said, what do you mean? And she explained what it was. I went back, I was in my mid forties. And that was a revelation to me. I went back to my parents 
My mother had died by then. But I said to my father, did you know that I had dysgraphia? And he said, yeah, we had you tested. And that was the thing they had found so many years ago. Avi continues to be an inspiration to people who have learning differences and hopes his story can motivate people to pursue their passions, even if they're told they can't do it. When you have these kinds of frustrations, you get very angry at yourself. You think of yourself as stupid. You can't believe you wrote something so inept. You can't stand the comments, et cetera, et cetera. So you wind up being frustrated and angry at yourself. And what I have received once I learned this was simply the way my brain worked, is not to be angry at myself. People with these kinds of problems develop compensatory skills. I love to read my books to kids with these problems because they're wonderful listeners. Yeah. And they're very sharp. They are, in fact, I find uh, intelligent in ways that kids who don't have these problems often are. Mm. They're very perceptive. For younger people, I think it's often the parents who need to be educated, right? Yeah. And, and certainly schools and teachers. So the main advice I give is don't be angry at yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Go with it and find ways around it. And you can, the way I did. And uh, learn to do what you want to do in your own fashion. For A World of Difference, I'm Cindy Peterson. Thanks, Cindy. And congratulations, Avi, for making a difference. And that does it for this edition of A World of Difference. I'm Daryl Owens. I'll see you back here next time. You can watch episodes of A World of Difference on the Beacon College Facebook and YouTube channels and on the show's website, awodtv.org. The website also provides tip sheets and other resources for your parenting journey. And you can listen to the show on the go on Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and other popular podcasting platforms. Thank you for watching and supporting A World of Difference.